I'm here representing something much bigger, uh, this wonderful company that I work for, the Disney Company, and specifically Imagineering, the group that designs and builds all the theme parks and cruise ships and resorts around the world for the Disney Company. It was started over 60 years ago by Walt Disney with the specific purpose of bringing one of his dreams uh, into reality, uh, Disneyland, a place where adults and uh, children alike can have a great time, where um, you can unlock the child within you, where uh, 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 there's a, a safe and reassuring environment where, where people can really let go, and where magic does happen, and where uh, memories can be made, happy memories can be made that last a lifetime. And it was a, a pretty incredible journey. I've been with the company 21 years. Um, clearly, I, I love my job, I love the Disney company, but it wasn't always that way. In fact, uh, 21 years ago, I had no idea what um, a Disney park was. I was 27 years old, um, and uh, I, the company I worked for got acquired by Disney. Now, I did not go to a Disney park. I have wonderful parents who were very supportive and nurturing. Um, we took a lot of family vacations, but we would go to battlefields. We tracked every bit of the Civil War. We went to the Smithsonian. We go to concerts. We visit family. Uh, my father specifically didn't really think that any good value or anything positive as far as learning could come from visiting a theme park. He had never been to one, and so he just had his preconceived notions of what they were. Uh, so here I was, 27 years old, and I was, uh, I had recently dropped out of law school after two months. It just didn't uh, work for me, and I was trying to pursue a dream of becoming a filmmaker. Um, I had uh, two film credits. I was a special fix cameraman on a couple of movies working for this really interesting small company, and one day we got acquired by the Disney company, and I found myself sitting across the table from this very nice person from, from Disney, as they all are, and uh, she said, you know, you're an Imagineer. And I said, I was an English major, that's not even a word. So I have no idea <laughs> what, what you're talking about. And of course, she's totally appalled, thinking, you know, my God, you're, you're an Imagineer and you don't know what that is. She goes, you know, you're, you're going to go to California and you're going to design theme parks. And I was like, mm, I was really kind of hoping to end up at the studio and make movies. And she said, well. So um, I'm on a plane uh, from New York out to uh, Glendale, California. And to my surprise, I find myself literally in this unbelievably interesting group. I was put in the research and development group of Imagineering, so it really is the wizard's you know, play shop where there's a scientist. Um, my, the guy sitting next to me was a PhD scientist working on environmental science and sustainability, unexpected for the theme park business, I thought. Um, there was a, and as I wandered around this Imagineering uh, organization, I was con consistently blown away by the caliber of the people. Everybody there was an expert in their field. There was engineers, um, there was artisans of every sort, sculptors who were master sculptors, painters, 141 different disciplines, uh, people who specialize in art glass, um, all in the service of this theme park. Uh, and, and these people don't leave. People were there for 40, 50 years. It's common for an Imagineer to, to you know, uh, be around for 40 or 50 years at Imagineering. In fact, uh, my 21 years, uh, the other day, an Imagineer came up to me and said, you're, you're just about halfway. And I, I said, oh my God, so these people are dedicating their life to this, this product. And uh, so what is this product? Why is this? What's this passion that is behind this? And uh, as I mentioned, I had never been to a theme park and I was acquired by the company. And so in the first week that I worked, at Imagineering, I was asked the inevitable question that everybody gets asked, what is your favorite Disney theme park attraction? And I said, I don't know, I haven't been. This was appalling, so they immediately put me on a jet to Florida with a list of attractions that I needed to go experience. And I was completely blown away by the scale of the, the, the parks and the resorts. But not only the size of it, but also the detail, the attention to detail, uh, the color choices, the planting, the fact that Everybody there was smiling and happy. There were marching bands. People were eating fudge <laughs> and doing bizarre things. And uh, um, they were willingly, you know, even adults were acting like children, and, 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 but in the best way. They were wearing crazy hats and, 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 you know, sort of swarming around to get their photo with these oversized animals dressed in human clothes like chipmunks. And this whole place is lorded over by this mouse, which everybody seems to know. In fact, you know, if... You, President Obama or, or, or Beyonce walked down Main Street Disneyland, they would be pushed out of the way if Mickey showed up. Uh, and this is the kind of place that it is. And being a New Yorker, we are trained not to make eye contact with strangers. And if someone asks you a question, you ignore them because they're probably going to try to mug you. And so in this place, what I saw were complete strangers acting like everybody was good, everything was fine, everybody was friendly. There are no strangers here. Because in this place, you, there's a certain contract you have in that everything is safe, everything is reassuring. 
And so I really found myself intrigued by what this was. And I, I began searching for some answers as to how does this work? This is, this is, this is something that's very unique because it transcends cultures. You know, at that time, and even now, we've got Tokyo, uh, parks in Tokyo, France, Hong Kong. We're building in Shanghai now. Two parks in the United States. We've got cruise ships. And these, it, it just transcends cultures. The response is the same. So there's something really core that's happening here. Fortunately, at Imagineering at that time, there was a sage. There was a guru. His name was John Hench. And John uh, was one of the original Imagineers. He worked uh, with Walt. He touched the, the cloth, the sacred cloth of Walt. And he was very much the philosopher. Uh, his specialty was color. He's famous for having answered, you know, once when someone said, paint this white, and he said, uh, which white? There are 58 different shades, each evoking a different mood. And I, in the first year, I finally got the courage to go see John and ask these questions of him. And I went up to his office. He was on, you know, the, the second floor, which is the top floor of our building. And he had a big office with a balcony where he'd go smoke an occasional cigarette. And, he was in his 80s at the time, and he had this mustache and a cravat, very kind of class act, and I thought this is probably what Walt Disney would look like if he were still alive. Um, he was a, a real interesting character. Uh, he was uh, very good friends with Salvador Dali. They drove across the country in a Ferrari. Um, he was uh, famous for reading the palms of uh, flight attendants. You finished that story on your own. Um, and uh, quite the late man, even in his 80s, he had two assistants who clearly adored him, and they were 20 years his younger, so they were in the 60s. But uh, so he was, he was very, but he was very philosophical. And my first question to him, well, I, I thought I'd only get one because um, I figured he was very busy, and this was sort of a sacred moment. My uh, first question to him was, John, tell me about this mouse. You know, why does Mickey? resonate so well with people. And he said, you know, I asked Walt that question, and Walt didn't know. And he said, but I've done a lot of research over time, and I think when you boil Mickey down into his three circles, you'll often see Mickey Mouse done as the two ears in, in circles. He said, I think this, this, this is reminiscent of the ancient symbols, and, and the, the Olympic symbols are an extension of this ancient symbol. And I said, oh, do you think that's it? And he goes, no, actually, I don't, because I think it's something much deeper. I think it's, it goes into the the amygdala, it goes into an atavistic kind of thing. He said if you, uh, there was this, he said there was an observation of infants would often pick a Mickey plush out of a pile of plush, and uh, this is when they were too young to really understand who Mickey could possibly be, but they would, they would be drawn to this specific plush toy. And his theory was, if you're an infant, you need to survive. Survival is your main thing. And survival means you have to find food, and food for you is your mother, and specifically, the breasts of your mother. And if you boil down the shapes that they're looking for, it's two circles and the belly. So it's the breasts and the belly of the mother. And so I said, unexpected answer, not what I thought I'd hear. But he really firmly believed that this, that this Disney thing works on that level. And I told you about um, that first day I went to the park. I, hadn't, I, I had a list of attractions, and one attraction that I went on really floored me. Uh, it was Peter Pan. I got on Peter Pan, and there was a little pirate ship comes up, and you go through the bedroom, and you fly out the bedroom window, and you're over the streets of London. And I suddenly found myself really feeling like a kid, because I had dreamed of as a kid, you know, my bed is sort of flying out the window and, 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 and being free. And, I, and this dream was actually happening. And I called my parents that night, and I said, you were almost the perfect parents. <laughs> You just blew one thing. You should have taken me to Disney when I was a kid. And as a nine-year-old, had I had that experience, I think I truly would have been transformed. I probably wouldn't even thought of going to law school. I would have known that what I wanted to do was bring this kind of joy and happiness th through design into the world. Um, so I went back to John Hench and I said, tell me about the attractions. What is it about these attractions that work so well? I had this powerful experience. Um, and uh, he said, you know, one day he was walking in the park, and he would go down to the park and just watch the guests um, and uh, follow them to learn their behavior and see what resonated with them. And he watched this one unique group. Uh, it was a group of women, middle-aged women, who not, not common to see in those days, a group of middle-aged women together without any kids or any husbands or men or anything. And so he, he followed them, there were four of them, and they went on Space Mountain, and it took quite a bit of encouraging for them to go on Space Mountain. But they went on, and he ran around to the other side, to watch them come out. And when they came out, he said they were absolutely giddy. One went down and kissed the carpet, and they were patting each other on the back. And he realized that that experience 
made them feel alive, more alive than they'd probably felt in a long time. And he said, and that's what we're doing here. We're doing these experiences in this completely safe, reassuring environment where everybody can let go and have these kinds of experiences and feel alive and be in the moment and truly experience happiness. And I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing. This is almost taking on noble kind of work. My last question to John was about Walt himself, because I began to want to understand the mind behind these visions and these products that we, we're so involved with. And you really can't decouple the two. Even to this day, Walt's vision drives a lot of what we do. And I asked him if there's one thing about Walt Disney that you would say was the key to why he did what he did, all this, this focus on happiness. John said, Walt loved people sincerely loved people. And he told a story where one day, Jean was arguing over how much detail a stagecoach should have on it, and he said, the people won't notice. And uh, Walt got angry at him and said, they will notice. Even if it's subconscious, they'll notice. And he said, John, you need to understand something. In Walt's opinion, there are no bad people. All people are good. If people have a bad reaction to something, if they act badly, it's because of bad communication. And in Walt's vocabulary, communication was through design. He, if he said to, to John, he said, and we, and we hold this today, that if you didn't get the response as the designer of, in this case, you know, a, a, an experience, a product, whatever it might be, it's because you're a bad communicator as a designer. The converse is true, too. Good design brings out the best in people. And I think this goes not just for theme parks and architecture, but it goes for the design of societies. <laughs> How we approach anything in life is, can be designed. And this notion that you can purposefully do this to bring out the best in people, and we even go further at Imagineering because we're focused on making people happy, not just goodness, but actually make people happy. Everything we do, every color we pick, every detail we choose, is will this actually create an experience that will create a happy memory? And I think um, it's particularly fitting today, I was sitting here this morning, listening to the incredible work everybody is doing here. Uh, and uh, it, it, it dawned on me that this work around, you know, uh, getting rid of Alzheimer's and helping people preserve their memories um, is something that I personally applaud and is is fantastic, and just as we heard earlier this morning that uh, none of you will give up <laughs> on research that will help us allow people to keep their memories, we at the Disney Company, I can guarantee you, will never give up on creating places and experiences um, that will allow people to create happy memories <laughs> worth preserving. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you have to visit, well, they're not allowed to come to Imagineering, right? No, well, you know. <laughs> they're allowed. Call me. Uh, this, <laughs> is, Imagineering is a place, how many people do you have there? Uh, it, well, around the world we have over 2,000. In Glendale we have anywhere between six and 800. So, 2,000 people imagining. <laughs> how do we make other people happy? And I've been to a couple of uh, their programs where I've been teaching, what strikes you is that there's three elements that go to the enormous success of Disney. Mm. And I just want to share them. Please. Because you have a shared vision, mm -hmm. makes people happy. Mm -hmm. They're completely bonded emotionally. Yeah, it's a tribe. It's a tribe. And then the third thing is they're all complementing each other's strengths. Yes. That's the it's formula. It's That's true. the formula. And, uh, you know, we have other data now from Gallup that, and I shared that with you, that the best way to get rid of your enemy is to increase their capacity for well-being and happiness. Right. So I think we should have, when things settle down, a few Disney parks in the Middle East. I, and uh, you know, else. you said that. <laughs> and, you know, but to that end, it's interesting. Uh, you know, when you look at what, where Walt Disney was going with his vision, he was kind of done with the theme park business. His vision for Epcot was actually a city, a design. He did believe that you could design a city that would encourage people to behave better, to be happy. And uh, now Epcot is a place where we 
tell stories of human achievement. The, the magic there is real. It's humans, people like yourselves who are doing wonderful things in the world. And I've been talking to Deepak, and um, uh, you know, my role at Imagineering is to brainstorm the ideas. And uh, for Epcot, we like to partner with people who are doing unbelievable things in the area of human achievement to make the world a better place, to make people happy. And uh, we have a pretty good gift at storytelling, and we find that that combination is often very powerful in getting the message out there. And so as we start exploring Epcot, you know, I would like to invite people to talk to me and, and see if there's some connections we can make and some of these stories we should share. We get a lot of people through our parks. About 50 million people a year visit Disney parks. So it's a great platform. They're in a great mood. They want to hear things. And I think what I heard today, uh, though there's so many challenges challenges, there's so much optimism and hope that I feel being here because you see how much great work is doing. Uh, and uh, Peter McGraw is a, a colleague of mine and, and Carmen Smith. We've all been sitting there ourselves brainstorming how we could visualize this and do it in ways that our guests, I think, at our parks would just get excited about where the world is going. So that's something I would love to talk to anybody about. Bruce Swan, thank you. Thank you very much. I love the Disney company, but it wasn't always that way. In fact, uh, 21 years ago, I had no idea what um, a Disney park was. I was 27 years old, um, and uh, I, the company I worked for got acquired by Disney. Now, I did not go to a Disney park. I have wonderful parents who were very supportive and nurturing. Um, we took a lot of family vacations, but we would go to battlefields. We tracked every bit of the Civil War. We went to the Smithsonian. We go to concerts. Two film credits. I was a special effects cameraman on a couple of movies working for this really interesting small company. And one day we got acquired by the Disney company. And I found myself sitting across the table from this very nice person from, from Disney, as they all are. And uh, she said, you know, you're an Imagineer. And I said, I was an English major, that's not even a word. So I have no idea <laughs> what, what you're talking about. And of course, she's totally appalled, thinking, you know, my god, you're, you're an Imagineer and you don't know what that is. Where adults and uh, children alike can have a great time, where um, you can unlock the child within you, where uh, 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 there's a, a safe and reassuring environment where, where people can really let go, and where magic does happen, and where uh, memories can be made, happy memories can be made that last a lifetime. And it was a... a pretty incredible journey. I've been with the company 21 years. Um, clearly, I, I love my job. We visit family. Uh, my father specifically didn't really think that any good value or anything positive as far as learning could come from visiting a theme park. He had never been to one, and so he just had his preconceived notions of what they were. Uh, so here I was, 27 years old, and I was, uh, I had recently dropped out of law school after two months. It just didn't uh, work for me, and I was trying to pursue a dream of becoming a filmmaker. Um, I had... Uh, I'm here representing something much bigger, uh, this wonderful company that I work for, the Disney Company, and specifically Imagineering, the group that designs and builds all the theme parks and cruise ships and resorts around the world for the Disney Company. It was started over 60 years ago by Walt Disney with the specific purpose of bringing one of his dreams uh, into reality, uh, Disneyland, a place